ஒரு It's a bit different and has a more specific definition to it. We'll discuss that later on. Right. Kiyom Bala. Hi, hi, hi. 36 year old. Fear for 12 days. I have no idea. 12 days, any present fear. Alright, that's fine. So, we presented it. Fear for 12 days and? Cough for 3 days. Cough for 3 days. Hari. Ta hai in kya? Kya hai in? Loud, loud, loud. Ta hai in. Pretty much say I know. Do you not you can hear? No, you can't. When did the cough start? Four weeks ago. Ah, I can't. How long is this for loss of appetite and loss of weight? Right. Right. Shall I stop you there for a moment now? This is the first day, no? so we will stop there for a moment and just talk up to this. You can 
putu haroga nara hari ini. Right, we talk a little bit about this patient. So this, from what information we have so far, this is a 36-year-old police officer and father of one with cough for three weeks and fever for 12 days. That's the presentation. Now, from what we have gathered up to now, we can identify at least four important symptoms in this patient. What are the four important symptoms that this patient has? Fever, cough, uh, maybe pleuritic chest pain, and loss of appetite and loss of. There are five important symptoms that this patient has. Right. Now, Samutra started the Katava from the fever. I would have preferred Samudra now because this story does not start on the 2nd of November. Now, these five symptoms have come at various times. Right. Now, what you have given to me is more like a snapshot of this patient's presentation. Snapshot take a in a snapshot. If I take a photograph of you now, it will just show you how you are now. Right? It does not tell you how you came here. Right? Does not give you the story. So, if I were Samudra, I would start off by saying that this patient was initially apparently well and developed a cough on the whatever, what when were the three weeks ago? Okay, I always told you start give dates do not say three weeks ago four weeks ago give dates so now if the november nang kia the maybe from early october right so that is the importance of getting a timeline like this so make sure this is all learning no first day no, no problem you have to when you are presenting a case give the timeline that is essential so in these complicated cases like PUO and things like that, it is essential to draw a timeline. You do not have to draw a timeline for dengue and upper respiratory tract infection, but in these sort of patients, draw a timeline. What was the initial symptom, right? Then what came next? What came next? So, in this patient, what is the first symptom that came? Cough. The first symptom that came was cough. So, start the history from there, right? And then gradually build it up to the current point. Or point of presentation. So, you cannot do that. It is very clear when you say the patient right in the uh, early October developed a cough. Right. Okay. Now, there, so that is the first statement you say developed a cough. Now, there you have to do a little bit of a description of that cough. You have to do a little bit of a description of that cough. Without jumping and saying there was no hemoptysis, you have to do a description of that cough. So, according to the knowledge that you have now, you have been through two medical appointments. If a patient develops a cough as a symptom, what are the things that basic things that you should mention about it? Okay, so first thing is, is it a dry cough? Is it a productive cough? Right? If it is a productive cough, what color is the sputum? Color is the sputum can a white, yellow, or blood stain or frank blood. Do not use words like hemoptysis in the start of your history because that is a medical term. Ne. We generally do not encourage medical terms, especially at the start of the history. You can use medical terms in the summary, yes, of course, but not at the start of the history and definitely not during the description. So, blood stain, it, whether it was blood stained or not. So, that information you need to tell. Hurry. What are the other things that we have to talk about when you are describing a cough? Timing of the cough, yes, the timing of the cough, whether there was any specific timing. That is very relevant, very important in certain cases. So, you need to tell. Make a udeda, havasada, arakada, make a tibbe here. Or is it morning, afternoon, persistent throughout the day, right? Is it variating diurnally? Those things you need to tell. Right. Tama monoad. Now, before coming to associated features, anything else about cough? Yes, sir. Triggers, precipitate, precipitants. 
So, was the cough precipitated by anything? Neither. Anything else that you need to tell about cough? With precipitance, also say, is the cough postural? Sometimes a postural cough might mean a lot. If the patient is coughing when lying down, that means that there might be some aspiration or regurgitation. So, that is very important. The situations that it occurs in, the triggering factors. That is how you analyze it. Anything else about cough that you need to mention? Yeah, if there is sputum, you have to tell the amount and anamai okkoma, you have to take it. Right. Anything else about cough? Now, this is also important because you have observed this take head at the end. Yeah. So, evage, eket, to evage tamai. When you have a symptom, you have to describe that symptom or ask questions about that symptom. Huh? Yeah, it is the nature or character of the cough, whether it is sort of a wheezy cough or whether it is a sort of a barking cough, harsh cough. These are all important because they give you a lot of information regarding the diagnosis or the cause for the cough. Hmm. Okay. Then, so we have got quite a lot of information now. Cough, the character, the onset, whether it's the aggravating factors, precipitants, everything we have asked whether I sputum or not, we have gone through in absolute detail. Now, cough, what system is cough originated from? Respirate. So, whenever you have a symptom of a certain system as a prominent presenting symptom like in this patient, always make it a point to ask other symptoms, other respiratory symptoms. You do not have to present everything here, but ask the symptoms. So, in your observed history, if you have a cough patient, you have to ask the other respiratory symptoms. What are the other respiratory symptoms? Or podikalugan and cardiagan or liagan, a systemic review. Yeah, so cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, pluritic type, chest pain, those are the respiratory symptoms. Right? Just ask, and if you think it is relevant, say they were there or not there. Now, good up, negative sahala, you come present, but make sure you ask the symptoms, respiratory symptoms. Okay. Now, a mistake that people do, especially when you learn a little bit more, is now you try to and go for the DD of cough. Don't do that. Why? Why are we not doing that? Because there is only one symptom of many symptoms. Ah, differential diagnosis exploration should be with the whole picture, not with only a symptom. So, do not suddenly stop in the middle and say he did not have orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnia, right. So, just keep it that. But you have to give the description of the cough, the clinical description of it. Hari. Right. So, can you tell us about the cough again, Samudra? What sort of cough did he have? Kela Loud, loud, loud. So, in the evening, but there is no diurnal variation. There were no obvious aggravating or relieving factors and precipitants. And he also has associated fluoric type chest pain. Okay. And this was a rather sort of subacute, subacute onset cough. So, that detail should be there. Right. Then what happened to him? Now, if you take all your symptoms, what is the next symptom that came up? The cough and the pleuritic chest pain came together and yeah. then what happened to him? What is the next thing? Make a patanga That's before that nomi. Loss of appetite ka beta out of After right. So the next symptom that he get got was what? Fever. It was a fever kadavi. Right. So, the next symptom that he had now, he has going, had a cough now, 
now he is starting to develop fever so it sounds very nice now to de describe mmmi 3 week uh, in uh, early october the patient had cough of this nature here you describe the cough and then in early november the patient developed fever right now like we have done for cough you have to describe the fever also so now what do you how do you describe a fever what are the basic things that you need to describe a fever now we are trying to rewrite this history samudra so once we finish the class and discuss we should you should be able to rewrite it in a sort of a better way yeah so what what do you have to talk about when you are talking about fever when you are just describing fever what do you need to tell type of fever is important we'll come to that yes onset temperature then what is the what grade yes the peak what was the measured peak of temperature then yeah the pattern will come to what else now before coming to chills anything else now you have to visualize your now when you are describing a fever you are drawing a fever chart with words that's the easiest way of understanding how you describe a fever you are drawing a fever chart in words so what you say is the onset is like this it reaches a peak within whatever duration then the duration of the febrile spike how long does the febrile spike last for you have seen a fever chart no like this so what does the febrile and what is the peak temperature recorded so you are drawing a fever chart in words that's what you are doing then yeah then what happens when the fever comes down does it come to absolutely normal or is there still a bit of temperature going on in between the spikes of fever right? this is very specific information to ask everything very important so in between the spikes of fever are there what is there still fever and how is the patient during that time then what else now you have to describe this area of the fever chart now now what do you do then you have to say how many spikes of fever does he get per day you have to draw it no you have to draw it in words so how many fever spikes does this patient get per day and are there any long or prolonged fever free periods maybe days without fever so those things you have to describe okay right now you talk about chills directly associated symptoms chills malaise anorexia rigors those sort of symptoms right chills and rigors are supposed to be specific for what okay a deep collections of pus right so deep collections of pus abscesses that's supposed to be but i have never seen the because chills right or the way you ask it the patient will tell yes for anything so it's very difficult to lose it as a specific symptom right okay now based on this information you can then tell therefore the fever pattern is because now you have drawn the fever chart with words now you can say therefore the fever pattern is and fill the blanks what are the common fever patterns that you know what is the probably the commonest fever pattern is intermittent fever and that's the commonest fever pattern that you see where yeah? you have something like this no fever comes back to baseline What is a continuous fever? Huh? There is fever. Fever does not come back to baseline, and the variation of temperature is less than two Celsius. Less the variation of temperature is less than two Celsius.
baseline at nm and h the very small variation don't worry about this 2 degree or 1 degree the kela but because now fever patterns are not very useful because we modify it so much with antibiotics and paracetamol and things like that. Uh, I think I forgot to tell you is there is no point in telling that fever responded to paracetamol. That is a common thing that you say in your history presentation. All fevers respond to paracetamol except any that there is no diagnostic value of saying whether a fever responds to paracetamol or not. You know, all fevers respond to paracetamol except what? What? Pearls of medicine, all fevers respond by except hypothalamic fever, hypothalamic rare cause of fever, all fevers respond to paracetamol, right? So, no point in telling whether it responds or not, unless you are facing a patient with hypothalamic fever, which I have never seen in my life. So, it is very unlikely that you have seen it up to now and you will ever see it in your life. <laughs> hypothalamic fever is very, very rare, right? So, intermittent country what is remittent fever yeah fever spikes does not reach the baseline but there is a large variation between the things more than 2 celsius over there. so it is like continuous second but the variation spike variation is higher Types. Those are the main fever patterns. There are some other variations on these fever patterns, but main fever patterns are these three. There are things called re relapsing fever, but they are mainly under these three patterns. With that, with antibiotics. Yeah, so that is the problem. So, once you say the fever pattern, you are also say whether it was modified. So, if the patient received any treatment, antibiotics, it can ah, antibiotics occur. Okay, so it can, but the problem is it does not last for long, goes back up very quickly. So now okay, so yeah, so if the patient if the fever comes back to baseline, it is intermittent by definition. Uh, so, that is why most of our fevers are intermittent anyway because we treat with drugs, but you have to always say the patient was treated with medication also, that is important. It is very rare that you get a patient who not into a GP and taken paracetamol. So, there is no point in the fever responded to paracetamol, but telling that the patient has taken paracetamol might be important. Right? Okay. So, is this really a continuous fever? May some of them? Yeah, it looks more remittent fever, neither, right? Hurry. Right. Then what happened? Now you see the story, the timeline. Cough Tibuna. Now he has fever. Then what happened? Fever persisted and he also developed what? Then he had loss of appetite and loss of weight. Hi, hi. Dengue fever. So, has initially been treated as dengue fever. Hmm. Is this dengue fever? Yes or no? And to update you, still has fever. Bring his ticket. Ticket ticket. Yeah. I don't want to be a prof. I had a class second or in a hard product. 
ने मामे ने तामे प्रोफाइल क्लास से करना ही ना हरि हरि ओके हरि ओके राइट आधे थिंग आई फॉरगॉट टू टेल यू येस्टरडे वी हैव व्हाट एवर कल्चरल एक्टिविटीज एंड एंटरटेनमेंट ड्यूरिंग दिस अपॉइंटमेंट आल्सो सो एंड ऑफ द फोर वीक्स वी हैव अ जनरल सिंग सॉन्ग यू नो दैट नो मैं सो समबडी ऑर्गेनाइज दैट देयर आर प्लेंटी ऑफ सिंगर्स इन योर ग्रुप आई नो दैट सो नाउ जनरली द रिकॉर्ड इज 3 एएम सो इफ यू लाइक यू कैन ब्रेक इट 8 पीएम टू 3 एएम इज द रिकॉर्ड नाउ and end of appointment trip also yeah, so right right so this is the fever now chart so it looks very sort of a remittent fever but there is something odd eh? what is odd there is about a week or maybe two weeks i think eh? our fever free interval right so if you have been studying your mcqs and looking at books does this look familiar does this fever chart look familiar but you need to read a little bit around fever to really come across this go home and read about pell epstein fever and find out what that is pell epstein fever nobody has heard about it pell epstein fever hi adama balanto ne Pell Epstein. Okay, that's fine. Right. So now, do you understand the uh, Samudra? You understand the timeline, ne? That we have generated now. Right. Then what happened? Dengue fever. We just treat. Kara. Now continue the story. Now you tell the story. So dengue with a treat card. Then what happened? He got transferred here, ne? Nothing significant happened in between. Ah, uh -huh. epigastric pain, NHSL, and for further investigation. Right. So we stop there for the moment. All right. Now what is our main clinical problem here? It's prolonged fever. Any fever more than seven days is prolonged fever. Right. Any fever more than seven days is prolonged fever. Ah, yet worsening dyspnea also it seems. Worsening dyspnea also during the hospital stay. Probably exertional. Exertional. Don't use dyspnea again. Say there is difficulty in breathing or exertion. Progressive. So now we are dealing with a patient with prolonged fever. What is the difference between prolonged fever and PU? I told you that they were not the same. What is the difference between prolonged fever and PU? PU has a very nice definition, which again you have to write down there for homework. There, you can find it in any bloody book. Pyrexia one known origin. What is the definition? So, what is the definition? 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 Mind you, I do a lot of spoon feeding, but I can't feed everything. So you have to do a little bit of work on your own also, right? Hari. Okay. Now here we are dealing with a patient with prolonged fever. Now we discuss the causes of prolonged fever and try to see whether we can come up with a good differential diagnosis for this person. Right. So tell me the causes of prolonged fever. Oh, varahanga thule P U O. You can call it tentatively call it P U if you like. Yes. Now you have to have an approach to this. Right. The first thing to do is you have to decide the 
category that you are going. Okay, that's the first thing to decide. I did a lecture on this show. So, category that you are going means what? No, not infect. Before that, there is another category. No, no. What sort of characteristics is the patient having? Now, in pneumonia, you know, community acquired pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, you know, like that in PUO or prolonged fever, also there are categories. So, what are the categories? community acquired or classical PUO or prolonged fever, you can call it prolonged fever, PUO interchangeably for the moment. Classical or uh, community acquired. So, in your analysis of the problem, that category should be defined first. Okay. Sorry. The next thing is hospital acquired PUO. Like in pneumonia, you know, pneumonia to homa classify karno So, hospital acquired PU. Right. Third, PU in immunocompromised patients. This might be things like HIV or maybe a medication, immunosuppressive medication. Then what? Tamanal. Yes. Anything else? Any other categories? PUO in transplant recipients, especially uh, the textbooks keep it as bone marrow, but we do not do a lot of bone marrows here. Transplant recipients, they are immunocompromised thamai, but it is a sort of a slightly different category as well transplant recipients. And the last one which is becoming frequently more important is PUO in the return traveller, right? Because with global travel, we go all over the countryside, we are all over the world. So, even though we are from Sri Lanka, we are still have, we have still have a category called the return traveller because especially people go to Africa and India, they bring back very exotic infections that you do not find here, right? Even in America, there are some funny infections that you do not find here. So, so because Lanka when is a return travel there is right so there is something like that right so that is the next category those days they used to call it tropical medicine right but nowadays we don't call it that because the whole world is connected hari okay so that's the first category so by the looks of this this patient is very likely to belong to the first category we didn't find any past history of immunosuppression but it, still possible that he might have retroviral illness that is a different matter, but there is not any drugs or anything like that for immunosuppression. Right. Then you come to your next category. Once you have decided what category, why is this category important? Why is it important? Because it gives you an idea of the cause. Then classical pyrexia of unknown origin, there are four other causes, categories again. So, these two steps you have to go. So, what are these causes now tell me? Kiyombalan? Sohan Kiyombalika? Infection, inflammation or autoimmune diseases, neoplastic disease and there is another category called other. If you take infections, what sort of infections cause prolonged fever? Do all infections cause prolonged fever? No, they do not. What are the characteristics of these infections that cause prolonged fever? They are okay, funny organisms that do not rapidly proliferate and cause a lot of trouble. For example, Staph aureus is never going to cause PUO because the patient is going to die before you reach the diagnosis of PU. So, basically, so evaki. So, there are these are these atypical, insidious, growing, hidden, funny looking organisms inside your body, right? Right. 
So, that is one characteristic of the infections that you see in PUO patients. The other thing is these infections are usually very deep and in very inaccessible places right deep inaccessible places like the prostate or ear or that then various things. So, that can be another feature of these infections deep inaccessible places or uh, atypical insidious funny organism that slowly grows, but it is difficult to kill also fellow is there right ok. Now, in a long case now there are thousands of infections that can cause PU thousands in a long case what are the things that you focus on because now you have to ask direct questions to see you know. So, what you have thousands of causes of organisms that cause PU, but you focus only on a few what are these few bacteria if you are a classifier can know but generally tell me TB yes number 1 2 and 3 is TB. So, you have to ask about TB. So, direct questions could be now in this patient already has cough that is a different matter right. What are the other classical features of TB not classical, but you see this quite often. Yeah, the fever is mainly nocturnal. So, in your fever description that also has to come I forgot to mention that initially, but it comes when you describe the fever periodicity nocturnal fever and they also have night sweats that is the important feature in TB. Right. Anything else that they have TB people? Huh? Yes, they also have very significant loss of appetite and that leads to loss of weight. I have never seen a patient with TB who did not have loss of appetite and severe loss of weight very important. contact history of TB is that very useful? No, unless there is a first degree contact. Well, all of us have a contact history of TB in a fellow on the road will have a contact history of TB. So, unless there is a say your mother had TB or father had TB or you are caring for a TB patient or something like that, there is no real no real use in contact history. So, TB is one. Next one, you got it. Long cases probability if you get a PU or TB, yes, definitely, yes, you will get mycoplasma, endocarditis, yes, endocarditis. So, if you take the long cases that we give you, PU was generally TB endocarditis, so they can cut them usually. We are talking about infection. TB endocarditis, thermonol, what else? TB endocarditis, typhoid, that is again a common thing that you see. I have not seen it in a long time, but that is something that you see. What is the presentation of typhoid? Typhoid generally comes with does it always come with diarrhea that is the question I am trying to get at no it does not can cause constipation commonly causes constipation. Remember typhoid does not cause fever beyond 3 weeks generally not beyond 2 weeks even because a patient is either spontaneously cured by that time if you remember that uh, life cycle or is dead by that time. So, generally typhoid do not say now go I will work you know 6 months history of fever typhoid out completely when number bad typhoid ok typhoid cover yes no, lepto does not cause PO typhus yes that is another thing that we see quite often infection that we see typhus and typhus is very high on the cards if, if there is whatever travel history to a jungle or something like that, but remember there are lots of urban cases of typhus also in cities are typhus you know, but if there is a history of some travel and with that you have to learn that a travel history is an essential part of a PUO history very important.
ट्रैवल हिस्ट्री वन और टू मोर ऑर्गेनिजम समथिंग दैट वी नाउ सी क्वाइट ऑफन इज मीलियोडोसिस मीलियोडोसिस वेरी इंसिडियस ऑर्गेनिजम लाइक टी बी डिफिकल्ट टू किल इंसिडियस ऑर्गेनिजम वॉट आर द क्लूज दैट यू माइट गेट इन हिस्ट्री टू से इट्स मीलियोडोसिस मेन इज द कंटैक्ट मेन इज द कंटैक्ट हिस्ट्री फार्मर्स एग्रीकल्चरल वर्कर्स सताइन ने पासवल क्लिप्स इन सॉइल so that's the way of main mode of contact i am going in sort of descending order hari the long cases wala tb endocarditis the first thing that you have to think of then you go down anything more retrovirus and related other infections because of the retrovirus you should always ask for their sexual histories if they have puo very important hari retrovirus what else what are the other infections right then you have this parasitic fellows malaria leash mania but they generally come from abroad they are imported infection so international travel if africa india anamanannang you have to think of those don't tell malaria in a patient who has not gone abroad nowadays where malaria is eradicated don't tell it as a dd right you will lose marks if you do that because you don't have any general knowledge sri lanka has been considered a malaria eradicated country so malaria is no longer in a dd unless you have been to another country where there is malaria like africa or india but we you might see us doing malaria in our patients why is that that's not because we think of it why is that why are we doing malaria in our pu patients even though they are not been abroad so that's important for surveillance now this malaria campaign has no work to do now no, no malaria no. so they want to somehow find the malaria so that's for sort of monitoring purposes re emergence you can catch no hey wagi and these people get a orgasm when they see a patient with malaria You have seen that about ten fellows come and what are going to be patients when they see a malaria patient. We had one about two years ago with some very odd manifestations. There were thousand people coming and seeing the patient every day. Hari. So those are some of the infections that you would think of. Right. Inflammatory conditions. What are we referring to? One other way. What are we referring to? We are referring to SLE and related autoimmune conditions. Yes. So SLE, all of you know what to ask: alopecia, oral ulcers, rashes. Can anybody remember one more auto-inflammatory disease that causes prolonged fever? Apart from SLE, Stills disease. Still, see, it's just typical rash which comes on with the fever and then goes away. It's called a transient, it's a reddish or evanescent. The word people use is evanescent rash. Still, this is, which is a sort of adult uh, form of systemic onset JI. Sojia, systemic onset JI. Right. Okay. third category what sort of malignancy can cause lymphoma lymphoma, lymphoma yes that's a most common malignancy that causes pu lymphoma and lymphoma presents identically to tb sometimes it also presents with night sweats uh, and uh, nocturnal fevers lymphoma So focus on that. There are some other rare malignancies that can present with PU, like renal cell cancer, for example. But those are very rare presentations. Renal cell carcinoma. Okay. 
प्रश्नित हाँ कालू बेनवा के राइट ओके देन द अदर ग्रुप मेनली इंक्लूड्स व्हाट ड्रग्स यस ड्रग फीवर इंडोक्राइन डिजीज लाइक थाइरोटॉक्सिकोसिस तो ना मना रियली कैन प्रेजेंट विथ प्रोलॉन्ग फीवर वेरी रेयर Right. So, in a patient with prolonged fever, you have to ask direct questions based on these infections, right? And also remember, I at in Liya gan travel history and sexual history is essential in any patient with PVO. That to agulova kawada kawat ganne na. Especially travel history and sexual history will never take otherwise. So, if you ever get a PVO patient for your in your ward or whether you uh, get it for exam, whatever it is. undergraduate or postgraduate or whatever it is you have to get a travel history detailed travel history local and international and also the sexual history right. okay now tell me the differential diagnosis of this patient now we have learned a little bit about prolonged fever the causes of prolonged fever what to ask in the history and so on now in this patient now we'll apply our knowledge to the patient Now what do you think? Now all of you have to see this patient after the class. Huh? Now this is now we is there a lecture hall so like or no? Now you have to really know there is a patient, real patient in the ward. You have to all of you have to go and see and go through the records and see. Right? Yes. So what are we thinking of now? How would you now? What is the differential diagnosis? This patient nocturnal fever, and night sweats, or something? Yes, he had. Go and check. So nocturnal fever, night sweats. What are you think of and uh, what are you thinking? Right? What are you thinking of? So there is something fever and respiratory, you know, and uh, maybe systemic was a loss of appetite, loss of weight. So it's mainly there. So what are the things that you are going to think of? D D T B. Yes, of course. If you don't give T B for as a differential diagnosis for this case, you will fail the case. Right? Because it's so obvious. You have to include T B. good next thing you might like to include is other causes of a pulmonary infection like what can cause pulmonary infections other causes in that list melioidosis mainly comes from soil but the it presents mainly with lung abscesses and things like that tb melioidosis because it causes lung involvement so there's cough and things like that so you are thinking could there be lung abscesses Lung abscesses, right? Okay, because of respiratory involved. Any other infections? Atypical pneumonia, meh, maybe nee. Atypical pneumonia, mycoplasma, you mean? Yeah, you have to always think of retroviral infection. and how does retroviral infection cause cough and shortness of breath yes commonest thing pneumocystis gyrovas infection yes so could there be retroviral with pneumocystis gyrovas retroviral people could have tb also and they might have this various atypical mycobacterial infections fungal infections Anything that can cause lung involvement, any of those can cause lung involvement. So, could this be a retroviral illness with some opportunistic infection? Those are called OIs, opportunistic infection. Opportunistic infection. Hari. So TB, meliodosis, retrovirus, all infections have to be on your list. Anything else you would like to include in your list? Yeah, I would also like to include lymphoma. A lymphoma can also cause lung involvement, 
nocturnal fever, night sweats and also uh, severe loss of appetite, loss of weight can be due to a malignancy and lymphoma is something that you need to consider. Right. Anything else that you want to include? Could this be SLE? In inflammatory very unlikely, eh? very unlikely, does not at all sound like a inflammatory thing. Right. Now, always it is good to have a list of 3 to 5 differential diagnoses right, for a case, not less than 3, not more than 5. So, we have 4 which I would think is generally good enough for this sort of case, right? TB, melioidosis, lymphoma and retroviral infection with a opportunistic infection, opportunistic we have many fungal, PCP, TB, anything. Right. So, does the patient have a travel history may Samudra? Travel, overseas travel, local travel, where? Yeah. Jeff 9 August. Hmm. Okay, so, travel history, what are the things that you think of is type, has he been to a jungle or in there? No, city. Right, okay. So, I would not include typhus because it does not generally cause, can cause cough, but very good to do include that. Sexual history? No, bro. is he married? Why? What is the wife doing? Is a teacher. So, sometimes you have to be careful. Now, your patient is the other person might be having sexual promiscuity. So, yeah, obviously, you cannot go and ask the patient about that. <laughs> but just because he does not come up with it does not mean he does not have the people hide it. And also, the other person might be having sexual promise, right? And it's not only males, partners. Oh, sorry. Now, if you have a female, male, him with a we have seen the other way reverse on many occasions also. So you can't make judgments like that. So, hurry. Uh, right. Now, keeping these DDs in mind, tell us the examination findings of this patient. Sorry? Ah, two pillows. Ah. Right. Not pallor, not pale. Not pale. Why is she asking about dental hygiene or looking at dental hygiene? Endocarditis, but it does not sound very much like it unless it is about endocarditis. What can, what sort of endocarditis can cause respiratory tract involvement? Right sided endocarditis because it can embolize into the lungs. Yes. Okay. Hurry. Ken. It is also good to measure the BMI in patients with PUO that will give you a quantitative idea of the weight and things like that also. Right. Cardiovascular system normal, no murmurs, sorry. Respirate system, ah. Plural aspiration, okay, that is the important thing. Uh, yes. Did you clinically find a plural effusion? Yes. Why do you say it is a plural effusion? Based on what signs? Uh, that is not the only thing. No, when I asked you what are the physical signs of plural effusion, you start on so inspection. Palpation, percussion, auscultation. Were there any recluse movements on that side? No. No. Only the percussion was stony dull and the breath sounds reduced. Ah, okay, fine. Did he have anything else abnormal about him in the examination? No. 
now again after the class what you have to do is we'll discuss this tomorrow before we go to the next case make a list of the things that you need to check for on examination in a patient with pu okara mage pote thiyena in any book you can find so you have to do it alone eka mage pota bala gana karanne pa i wrote that in a medical student long time ago me eka verdi thiyena thanne ne so try to do it on your own and compare it so uh, uh, so list we'll discuss that tomorrow before we do the next case but you have to do that on your own but then you will remember it and then when you go to the exam you will remember the things to look for right for example uh, stigma of endocarditis fundus ekey monawada balanno ne abdomen ekey monawada balanno those things you have to do and that can be that has been given in one once as a may short another short notes physical examination in a patient with pu right short notes on it so then you have to tell me me ma balanno ne e me so that might be useful for your theory also so you have to do that on your own we'll discuss that tomorrow before we start the next case right now what is the were there any lymph nodes that was uh, what i was uh, wanting to why am i asking about lymph nodes because lymphoma and even tb can cause lymph nodes where is the lymph node in tb generally in the scalene region scalene nodes ke me asse thiyenne meda e wala thama inne generally but in a more disseminated tb you can get generalized lymphadenopathy also okay so lymphadenopathy thibunne no lymphadenopathy राइट साइड left sided pleural effusion yeah but more on the left side so he had i think a left bilateral pleural effusion more on the left side pleural effusion pleural effusion hari so he has a pleural effusion hmm now is that an important finding is that an important finding of course it is yes but does it really help you to narrow down your differential diagnosis yes or no not really because any of those things that we listed can cause pleural effusions right so it doesn't really give you a lot of differentiating value but that's a very important finding and in the exam you will get marks for detecting that right so that's important to detect right pleural effusion but tb can cause a pleural effusion meliodosis can cause a pleural effusion lymphoma can cause a pleural effusion in retroviral opportunistic infection also there can be pleural effusion so it doesn't really change your dd at all right if you had find a murmur now you are going to include another dd of endocarditis but we didn't find it right okay fine now so we have four dds examination we have found a pleural effusion what is the next step in our diagnostic process in this patient now we have to do certain investigations now we have narrowed down a list of about 25000 causes of po into four in this patient right so what investigations will we do in this patient mai sir what sort of investigation we do in this patient okay good so that's a good start you would do investigations to diagnose it and maybe certain investigations to assess the severity but remember in any patient with po there are set four investigation that you do what are they these are called baseline basic investigation full blood count blood picture esr crp actually five and cultures cultures so full blood count blood picture esr crp and cultures blood culture urine culture sputum culture whatever culture you can you need to take that's essential right okay hari right next girl namale samalika samalka 
Chamarka? Yeah. Can Chamarka? Now, what are the specific tests you would like to request? So, if you were the house officer managing this patient, what are the specific tests you are going to ask? Ma, unto test. Good. What do you think, Chamarka, of the usefulness of the man to test in this space? Screening for TB. If it's positive, will it give you a diagnosis? No. But if it's strongly positive, might. Might. On that time, if it's large and ulcerating man too, then you might. Right? It might push you towards it's not definite, but if it's a very strongly positive ulcerating man too, it pushes you towards a diagnosis of TB. Hari. Okay, so yeah. Wait, wait, we'll come to that. Right. What, what else would you like to do, Chamar? Chest X ray, yes, good. Microbiological sample. Sputum acid fast bacilli, yes. AFB. Right. Retroviral screen, also you would do at this point. Why? What is the next investigation I am trying to get at? Why am I doing a retroviral now and I want to trace the result before I do something? What am I going to do now? Asisa, what am I going to do now? I have sent a retroviral, I have done the TB basic stuff and now I want to do something. What is the something I want to do? I have looked at a retroviral also before doing that certain thing. Yeah, you are good. There is a bloody pleural effusion. That's gold. In a PUO patient, if you find anything that you can aspirate or take out, my God, you thank your lucky stars. Right? Because there is something, no. Most of the PUOs are just even nothing in. Then you have to rely completely on investigations. It's very difficult and takes a lot of time. But here you have something staring at your face. There is a pleural effusion. So, why don't you take it out and see? You take out the pleural effusion and see what you find. Okay, so those are the basic investments I would do. Now I need you to you go through this. So there is a cytopenia in the full blood count. That is why probably he was treated for what? Now this girl mentioned that he was treated. I am for dengue. Ne? His WBC is 3.3, platelet is 172,000. So there is something going on in the blood or the marrow, right? And that can happen in any of these, even TB and lympho. Some marrow problem. Blood picture and monothi and nickel, I don't know. Persistent cytopenia. Hari. Plural fluid report. Protein 3.78. Then part of the end of fourth the osculate me. Part of the end Protein 3.78. What is that? Exudate or transudate? Exudate. Uh, LDH 5240, which is significantly high. Again, that suggests a exudate or maybe something else. WBC count 1780 percent lymphocytes, 11,000 red blood cells. Now, what? Exudate, lymphocytos and maybe a bit of traumatic also because the red cells. But the white cells, clearly there are quite a lot of lymphocytes. Now what? Now retroviral negative. So retroviral, exclude Karanapulwanda just because the screening test is negative? No, why? There is something called a window period which is very short now. Why is it very short now? Because we have very sensitive tests which now measure the do the antibody and the PCR in one test. 
So PCR is much earlier positive. Right? Right. Retroviral negative. Now what? Now what would you put as number 1 and number 2 on your list? Now we can clearly put something number 1 and number 2. What is number 1 and number 2? Tuberculosis, yes, of course. TB and lymphoma, yes. TB and lymphoma. And lymphoma, especially this LDH being very high, that is also a feature of lymphoma. This pleural fluid LDH is very high, so also a feature of lymphoma. Hmm. So, TB lymphoma. If you are thinking of lymphoma, the pleural fluid, what else should you have sent for apart from the full report? Cytology, very good. Cytology. Cytology. Hmm. Okay. ADA. What is ADA? Adenosine deaminase has also been sent in this patient. That is 51. That is high. The Upper limit is 30, upper limit of normal is 30. Then Moku ADA of 51. Yes, Shamari? Yeah. So, if you have a remember, if you have a lymphocytic pleural effusion with a high ADA, that has almost 90 percent chance of being TB. Okay. Lymphocytic pleural effusion, that is very important. Underline the word lymphocytic, ha? you cannot do this in a neutrophilic effusion. Lymphocytic effusion, ADA is high, the cutoff is 47 if I can remember, which more than 47 is the almost 90 percent probability of tuberculosis. Right. Right. So, based on probabilities, what would we do in this patient now? Now, patient I be sent from police hospital is frustrated now. What would we do now? We, we would start him on anti TB, isn't it? There is enough justification to do that. But are we going to forget the lymphoma? No. So, therefore, what are we going to do to catch the lymphoma, which can be very difficult sometimes? CTs, chest, abdomen looking for lymph nodes because there are no lymph nodes outside ne, to take. So, we are going to look for lymph nodes inside. Right? And we might be able to biopsy some of these lymph nodes. We are going to do that. So, that is very important. You do not forget lymphoma and TB. Where lymphoma is a close second. So, do not say. And at that initial point, there was a cytology, there was some abnormal cell scale report, but then it later turned out to be normal, just inflammatory. Right. Okay. So, that is what we are doing. We are doing the CTs. There is some lymph node in the mediastinum which we are going to biopsy most likely. But the patient has been started on anti TB. Miller dose is negative, I think. Mahitani negative, so check on that. Right. Now, I came today in the morning and saw this chart and told that you can we will start anti TB, but I want to seek conclusive evidence that there is no lymphoma in this patient. Right. We come back to that word now. Anybody heard of? I said of Pell Epstein fever. What is it? Ah, it is a fever pattern, yes. Yeah, so what is the what is special about this fever pattern? Nobody remembers? Jeevanath, you do not know. Asana? No idea. Rebecca? Yeah, it is associated with lymphoma, very good, yes. And if you look at a book or whatever, some people dispute that it exists, but this looks suspiciously like it. The key feature is they have fever, two weeks, no fever and fever again. It looks very much the case in this way. Suddenly the fever has settled and then come back. Right? So, it looks suspicious. So, I want to see conclusive evidence that there is no lymphoma in this patient. Right? Just by looking at a simple fever chart. 
Right, so that's it. Okay. Okay, so this is the general format in which we discuss cases. What we did was we first corrected the history a little bit because it's your first week with me. You have to understand how your why the timeline is so important. Does it do you understand why it's important now? And now you are rewrite this with the timeline and see how it sounds. Sounds much better. Then we have gone through causes of PUO, right? And then we have applied that knowledge to this patient and we have come up with a differential diagnosis. We have gone into the examination. You are supposed to write all the physical signs you look for in a PUO patient for homework. And then with the examination, we have concluded that our DD, we are on the right path. There is a pleural effusion. And basically, that's it. Then we discussed some of the key investigations you would do. And, uh, what you would do in this patient. In a PUO, nobody is going to ask you how you are going to manage this patient. Obviously, because it is a diagnostic problem and the whole discussion is going to be about how you diagnose. Right? Even are you going to start anti-TB in this patient is a question that we won't ask medical students. We will ask uh, registrars, the MDs, but not. But because this is fever, cough, very common, lymphocytic effusion, ADA high, I would be an idiot not to start anti or you would be very, very brave or foolish not to start anti TB in this patient. But, but remember, lymphoma is a very close second, especially the very high LDH in the pleural fluid. And with this odd fever pattern that is going on, you have to look for it carefully. And remember, lymphomas can sometimes be very difficult to diagnose. So, it can be very difficult. Okay. Any questions? Generally, no, unless you have a PET scan, right? So, if you have a PET scan, you can do that and certain nodes might light up and then you can do a directed biopsy from that. But otherwise, fast CT and maybe bone marrow, but lymphomas do not usually involve the bone marrow, it remains in the lymph node. So, generally, bone marrow is also good use. In the DDs. Yeah, if their retroviral became positive, yes, they would look for fungal and things like that. But in this patient, you go with a very. Yeah. If, if there is, unless there is a very clear past history of HIV or some immunosuppression, don't worry about it. No, no. Culture report to ne, cultures are frequently negative in plural effusions. The ADA is very useful. So, actually, this I'll teach you later on. Plural uh, history, plural effusion, lymphocytic, high ADA, and plural biopsy. Right? All four combined have almost 99% sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of TB. So, clinical features, pl lymphocytic plural effusion, high ADA, and plural biopsy. Put all of those together, almost 99% probability of TB. Those are suggested. You don't really need a culture. Yeah, those are non-specific systems. Hurry. Okay. So that's enough for today. Doesn't mean you can go. You can go now and come back at about 6 30. Kala uh, And there are lots of patients for you to see. Palle I did so three classes in the morning, uh, go and see those patients, there must be some interesting patients here also. So share the patients amongst yourself, look at your uh, colleagues patients and learn from them. Right? So the one and a half hours you have from 6.30 to 8, use that time productively to look at other patients and learn from those. And do any procedures that I told you, get down and dirty, get your hands dirty, do the procedures on your patients also. So that's important. Then you are in trouble. Right? So, do and we might. If you are around, we might even allow you to do horing. LP is also horing. But you have to show interest. Eva gave us Karana then Pulwang under strict supervision, of course. <laughs> That's not a very good thing to do, but we can. Right? So, him. Right?